What science is and how and why it works. So, okay, there is no free will, but we have a feeling that we have a free will. We act as if we have a free will. In terms of evolution, can that, is that adaptive or is just, uh, what do you call, a spandrel? Just some accident, um, this illusion of having free will? Great. Um, it might have originally been a spandrel, but it's extremely adaptive now in that it allows most of us to get up in the morning and it allows most of us to feel like we are part of something a lot, lot bigger than ourselves. And it allows us to like get through very difficult times. Um, but it's also a disaster if you are by anyone's standards, a failure in life for reasons you have no control over. And yet society has taught you that it is your fault. You should have been able to avoid that. If you are not as accomplished or rich or beautiful or famous or who knows what is the next person, free will. You should have been able to do that. There is an incredibly destructive soundbite in the United States that every child is taught in school, which is anybody can grow up to be president. And like with one exception, um, every single president we have had has been a wealthy white Christian male. So if you grew up and you're in jail as a drug addict, um, instead of being president, well, whose fault is it? You have, so it cuts both ways. Um, what I think you see is the myths that we make up for ourselves, whether it's a myth about free will and agency or a myth that there is a God who loves us or any other such myth, um, they can be very, very good at reducing anxiety. Um, but what they are mostly doing is reducing anxiety that that myth invented in the first place. Speaking of motivation, and yeah, for some people, for lots of people actually, being free in their choice is, as you said, a way to get up uh, in the morning. Uh, but how do you stay motivated if you actually, if you accept the idea that there is no free will, how do you stay motivated? How do you enjoy, uh, maybe not life in general, but how do you praise yourself? How do you get any enjoyment from accomplishments if you accept that there is no free will? It's hard. Um, I don't have terribly good answers for that. Um, you have to externalize some of your sources of pleasure. It is great that I've done those thousands of hours of practicing because I just made an audience of people very happy playing that sonata on the piano for them rather than, whoa, I am a great pianist. I've just come up with a vaccine that will cure COVID. And, you know, saving millions of lives has to count for something. Yeah, that's great. And soon we're all like Mother Teresa or Nelson Mandela. And we all know that like, it's very hard to be that selfless and, and Buddhist and detached in our like sense of purpose in life. Um, and instead we need exactly the sort of things that losing a sense of free will destroys. Um, it's kind of a drag. It's not a great thing until you look closely. And sometimes it's the most wonderful thing on earth. A great historical example of it, where, as I was saying earlier, wow, there's all sorts of stuff where it's not waiting 300 years from now. Scientists would just say, oh, my God, the things they used to believe, the damage that they did, where people lived long enough to be saying that about what they themselves had done at a younger age. It's 1950, you have a 17-year-old child 
who is beginning to act in a very thought disordered way. They're not making sense. They say things that make no sense. They're hearing voices. They're hallucinating. They're having, to, you take them to a doctor and it's the most heartbreaking thing imaginable. They say, it looks like your child has this disease called schizophrenia. And it's devastating and all of that. And eventually, after they're telling you, no, there isn't a cure and it's likely to destroy their life and all of that, eventually you get around to saying, where did this disease come from? What caused this disease? And if it was 1950, the wisest psychiatrists on earth, the wisest neuroscientists would have had an answer. They would say, it's you, you, the mother of that child, you caused your child schizophrenia. And something that was called schizophrenogenic mothering, a mothering style that generated schizophrenia, it started off as a Freudian notion, but it, it festered in all sorts of poisonous directions. And the basic core of it was that a horrible mothering style could produce schizophrenia. Um, and it was a mothering style that was built around a mother who unconsciously hated her child and wished that the child hadn't been born. Oh my God. And thus you were teaching hundreds of thousands of mothers for decades that they caused their child schizophrenia. And then in the mid 1950s, along came biochemists who discovered the first drug out there that had antipsychotic effects. And it worked not by going back in time and making your mother actually love you. It made you go back in time. It made you block dopamine receptors in your brain and everyone sat there. And in some cases, the psychiatrist didn't sit there. It took them about 20, 30 years to sit there and say, oh my God, it wasn't the mothering. It's a crappy biochemical disorder. It's brain chemistry. It's not the wrong kind of incompetent mothering. And what is remarkable is hundreds of thousands of parents of schizophrenics, that was one of the most wonderful days of their life because they had been told, at the very least, this is the most tragic thing any parent can see happen to their child, but at least it's not your fault. It's not your fault. And I have actually talked to, there's organizations in the United States, alliances of parents of schizophrenic children and support groups and all of that. Um, and I've talked to the founders of these organizations and they are all in their 90s now. And they say that it was one of the most freeing, liberating moments of their lives, the first time they truly accepted that they had not caused this disease. And the same thing happened with autism. Autism mm -hmm. up until the 1970s or so, the dogma was if your child had autism, um, you caused it because you could not love your child. And the jargon was you were a refrigerator mother. And then people discovered, no, autism has something to do with prenatal endocrine environments and there's genes and we're slowly sorting it out. And remarkably, one of the fathers of autism research and the notion of refrigerated mothers um, in old age came to a meeting, a support family group, and in front of an audience of a thousand parents of autistic individuals said, I am so, so sorry for the damage that I did. I thought I was doing good. I thought I was a healer. I thought I had devoted my life to making people's lives less painful. And all I did was spread pain further. And I'm so sorry for what they did. And what is remarkable is you talk to the 90 year old mothers of schizophrenics with their organizations and no leader of the school of schizophrenogenic mothering ever ever sat down and wrote them an essay or appeared before them and say, my God, I saw causality and free will and responsibility where there wasn't. And I am so sorry for the damage that I happened. So, okay, you stop believing in free will. Yes, depression, existential despair, all of that. For a whole lot of people, it's going to be the most wondrous liberating thing you can imagine.